The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. High places of the earth hills and mountains represent strongholds like governments, high institutions that govern everything else. Just so you know that. Where do we get this from? We get this from the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah, the book of Revelation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When God speaks of mountains, and this is important for everybody to see, in this world, you have a lot of people who always point at people. The Father never does that. Whose example are we following when we persecute one another? Not God's example. Here's the Father's example. Listen. He said, for the transgression of Jacob is all this. The Father is not a friend of anybody's sin. He delivers us. He's against the sin. He's not mad at you. He hates your sin. He loves you. He hates the sin. You all see that? It'll get clear. And for the sins of the house of Israel. So for the transgression of Jacob. And for the sins of the house of Israel. That's why he's coming down in a not so kind way. Is it not Samaria? He said, and where are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Do you hear that? These high places, these valleys, these places of occupation and power. He says, are they not Samaria? And he said, the high places of, of, of Judah, are they not Jerusalem? Now, just in case you don't understand that, why would he ever say that? Are the high places of Jacob, aren't they Samaria? What is he talking about? They adopted the ways of Samaria, just like America adopted the ways of every other country out there. We have become something else. Why? Because we have intermingled, adopted, began to follow all these different ways until we have an identity loss. Therefore, I will make Samaria as in heap of the fields. See that? Did he say he was going to smash Jacob? Did he say he was going to destroy Israel? No. He's going to go right to the source of the issue. So what's the source of the issue? Samaria. Look at your life. What is the source of your sin? That's something you have to ask yourself. What is causing you to sin? I can assure you, the Lord has made a decree in the New Testament. He will destroy whatever it is. Do you know that? Whatever it is, he's going to destroy it. And he also said it's going to hurt many of us when he does that. He will destroy it. He's going to destroy it. That's going to be a not so good transition. But it's for our deliverance. This very has a very sober thought. Because we give ourselves excuses to continue to sin so many times. Nothing has forced us to stay in sin. We are choosing it. So when he takes away our ability to have that sin, anything causing you to walk away from him, he will destroy it to give people a chance. Isn't that something? He's going to do that. He will destroy the source of the sin in our lives. And if we choose him after that, if we are truly free after that, then we're free. But if we go around and we reject him because we want the sin, it's going to be found out. It'll be found out in that time, in that era. Do you know some of that is happening now? Many of us are holding on to things we shouldn't hold on to. Frightened, we're going to lose it. The Lord does not want us to have anything that's caused sin in our lives. Sometimes it's other people. Sometimes it's wealth. Sometimes it's your skill set. Sometimes it's your mobility. Sometimes it's your health. He's going to destroy it so that we can finally be free from what has us bound. Now, in that moment, we have a choice to make, because we'll either thank him for our freedom, or we will curse him and try and find what we loved the most, which is that thing that was causing sin. That's coming. It'd be easy if the Lord took away our desires. He's not doing that. It's important that we choose. And in order to have a just choice, you have to be given an opportunity to actually accept one of two things. You guys see how that works? That means you can go to him or you can go back to the sin. Either way, he's not going to force you. It's the choice you have to make. Do you know that some of you are making that choice right now? In fact, we're making choices like that every day. They're just going to become more severe. There are certain things we cannot break from ourselves. So when he takes it away from us and he sets it distant from us, in order to get it back, we have to separate from him and go to it. During the falling away, many will separate from the Lord and go back to the thing. That's why he said in the New Testament, 
that uh, God's going to send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness, right? Because if you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you're going to chase the pleasure. You see how that works? That's why they're all damned, because they will separate from the living God to have it their way. Let's continue. Therefore will I make Samaria and heap of the field. That's a planting of a vineyard. And I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley. And I will discover the foundations thereof. See, everything exposed. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten into pieces. And all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire. And all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. You know what all the hires are? You guys know what those are? Those are your opportunities that we think we so desperately need to continue to survive. That's what that is. Distractions. Or what they really are. Distractions, nothing but distractions. Things that the world has us believe that we need to survive. Right now, all of us can survive by the living God. We just don't believe it. If we don't see our provision, we start going haywire, don't we? We get nervous. We don't yet trust the Lord's provision in the way he does that. Not yet. All the graven images are going to be beaten to pieces. Everything people have carved, everything they made and that they worship. A graven image can be a corporation. Do you know that? A graven image can be a company. A graven image can be anything that we have built that we nurture and take care of more than our neighbor. You know that? They're going to be gone. Distractions and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. All the idols, those are the inspirational things. Things we turn to to find inspiration. Some people turn to music. Some people turn to familiar things. Some people turn to all sorts of things, but they find comfort. Those are idols. When you have to have that one thing in your life or you can't make it, like a drink. Did you know a drink can be an idol? He says, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore will I wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make the wailing like the dragons in the mornings as owls. For her wound is incurable, for it has come unto Judah. He has come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Declare ye it not in Gath. Weep ye not at all in the house of Afar. Roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away, thou inhabitants of Sephir, having thy shame naked. The inhabitants of Zanon came not forth in the morning of Beth Bethazel. He shall receive you his standing for the inhabitants of Marath waited carefully for good but evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem they waited carefully for good highlight that verse 12 the inhabitants of Marath waited carefully for good the same thing people are doing now this is a shadow an echo of what we're doing right now what humanity is doing right now especially those who have not committed themselves to the Lord but they committed themselves to religion. They waited for some good, but the only thing that came for them was evil from the Lord. In other words, a very bad episode in life came from the Lord. Let me continue. Evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitants of Lashish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. She is the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. You know what a daughter of something is? A daughter of something is any place that has the ways of the mother. That's why that word daughter is used. As a mother, so is the daughter. That's a direct phrase from the prophets given to them by the living God. Let's continue. O thou inhabitant of Lashish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin to the daughter of Zion. For the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. All right, the sin of Israel was found in you. Therefore, shalt thou give presents to Morasheth, Gath, the houses of Ashib, shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. Yet will I bring and hire unto thee, O inhabitants of Marasha. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Make thee bald and pull thee for thy delicate children. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. Separation. All these weird, strange places. They adopted the culture of these places. For what reason? To replace the emptiness 
of what was given to them by the living God. You're going to see that too. In other words, they took up the characteristics of those places and people around them. Why? Because they got bored doing the same worship with the living God. The same thing people do now. They do the same thing. Well, I've got to, they say, I've got to put the Bible away and really concentrate into ancient aliens. Because I already know the Bible, but I don't know that stuff. What do they end up doing? I'll tell you what happens. They start to adopt these ideologies, which are in fact theories from these so-called experts who have not seen not one so-called alien, but they have heard from a person who heard, who then saw something written, who heard from somebody else how things went. They have no consensus on what they believe. All of them believe differently, so they interpret somebody else's story differently. And that person interprets somebody else's story differently, so on and so forth. And they don't know what's truth and what's not. They don't. But people love information. Same thing happened back then with Israel. Same thing happened back then with the house of Jacob. Same thing happened back then in Jerusalem. The same thing. They got bored with doing those routine things with the word of God. They were enticed by other societies. They took up practices God never gave them. Same thing we do today. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds when the morning is light. They practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Uh-oh. They practice what? Evil. Why? Because they can. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. What does God call evil? Does anybody know? Not, not people, not us. What does God call evil? Wouldn't you be concerned about what God calls evil? Forget about people's definition. Forget about a definition. What did God say evil was? I'll tell you this. God told us what was good. Anything outside of what he said was good is evil. That's what your father said. Everything outside of what God said is good is evil. How many of you know what God said was good? Uh-oh. See, there's no interpretation on that, is there? No. It's quite clear what he said was good. So then it should be quite clear on what is evil. See, often evil does not look evil. Evil looks delicious. Evil looks prosperous. Evil looks promising. Evil looks favorable. Evil looks convenient. Evil looks easy sometimes. Evil looks promising. Righteousness or good things look difficult. They look like they're impossible. They don't look too promising. Not too many people have ever been tempted by good Wouldn't that be something if people could be tempted to do something good? Let's continue. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. What is that? How do you work evil upon your bed? It's talking about your mind. That was actually explained in two books of the Bible. That was actually explained. And they practice it because it's in the power of their hand. So when you develop ideas, just because you can develop ideas, have you ever considered what the outcome to your deeds are? Have you ever considered how it's going to affect anybody else? concerning good and evil not what man calls good and evil but what god calls good and evil you ever consider that leaders of nations have they considered the policies they pass and what is causing people to fall into just because it's legal in the land does not make it righteous and if people are following these illegal policies that are legal by way of government by way of the land but it's unrighteousness to the most high Woe to them and woe to those who created the laws in the first place. See, we don't consider things like that, do we? Just because it came from some capital does not make it good. It does not make it good at all. Woe to them who have done these things. They practice it, it says in Micah chapter 2, verse 1. They practice it because it's in the power of their hand to practice it. So they can do it, so they do it. They do whatever they can do. It's not make it righteous. It's not make it good. And they covet fields. That's the land. Boy, everybody wants property. They covet fields and take them by violence. What does that mean? Defraud. Violence is when you scheme, devise, manipulate, practice business to get what you want. Say, for example, you have a company that deals with properties. Somebody can't pay their bills. You foreclose on them because they can't pay their bills and they're begging you. You're a Christian and they're begging you. Please, 
Now, people will say, well, it's, you know, it's just business. Yeah, woe well, to you. You're not called to be just like the world. You're not called to be like that. You're not called to share in the culture of killing people legally. You're not called to do that, to make money off that. You own a company, and you foreclose on someone who really needs help. Woe well, to you. Woe well, to you. Just because the world says it's okay to do, and it's a good business practice, does not make it good. Are you guys starting to understand? We're living in a world right now where most of what they say is good is an abomination to the most time. To take something by violence is to manipulate your way into doing it. To smile in somebody's face. Then when they get in trouble, you turn your back on them. Why? Because of your bottom line. Woe to you. And they covet fields and they take them by violence. And houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house. Even a man and his heritage. They destroy the future of many. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, see? From which ye shall not remove your necks. You can't escape what's coming. Neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. They're not going to get away with it. No one who ever practiced that will get away with it. This is the way the world is set up. This is what people are calling good. These practices, practices that are in the Christian community that God never gave us. I told a guy this one time, and you know what he said? He said, well, how are we supposed to live? Now, this guy did not own a mortgage company. He did not. He said, well, how are we supposed to live? I said, wait a minute. There are tons of businesses a person can start that do not take things by violence or by manipulation. I said, no Christian is bound to start a company that's a pornography business. Correct? You don't have to go start one of those businesses. Do you see how some a defense of flesh is? For an example, this guy said, well, how are we supposed to, you know, how are we supposed to survive in the world? We're talking about mortgage companies. And all of a sudden, he said that like that was the only business he could ever start. That was a defense of the flesh. And normally, a person will do that because they've never considered that. And, you know, statements take people by surprise. But we learn, right? We learn. But here's my point. You see this part where the Lord said that he would send an evil upon them from which you shall not remove your necks. You see that part? That's what's coming. It has not come yet. It's coming now. And unless people really understand this, really, but you have to search. You have to really desire the good. And the Lord's going to give people an opportunity. But a great many of them are not going to choose the Lord. They're going to choose prosperity. And they won't escape the penalty that's coming. Because the penalties are coming. All of what you hear ministers tell you about prophecy, they contain penalties. Many people don't want to be locked up or, or a victim of prophecy. And what I mean by that, they don't want to be in the middle of a flood, a landslide, right? They don't. Nobody desires to be in the middle of that stuff. It's coming anyway. Now, why would a person find themselves in that position? Because they choose that over God's good. That's why. They choose that over God's good. Do you see that? Instead of choosing righteousness, they'll say, nope, i got to survive. I choose the life I've built for myself. And anybody who says, well, it's just a difficult decision to make, work it out now. It bothers me to imagine people with children saying that they're not going to take the mark of the beast. And if they're alive at the time, as a great many people think they're going to be alive at the time, right? And if they're alive at the time, the Bible says they're not going to take the mark of the beast, those who are found in the book of life. So that means if you take the mark of the beast, that's it. You're done for. Because you're not going to take the mark of the beast, nor will you defend a kingdom of, of violence and murders of the things we're talking about now. If Christ is truly within you, you're not going to be a part of that. If you accept the mark of the beast, you have to reject everything that Jesus is. If, if, a, if a Christian were to go start a pornography company, they would have to reject what Christ is. Do you guys understand that? That person wouldn't have to actually reject Jesus, salvation, and everything else they would to do that. Because you just can't go do that with Christ. It defies everything about Christ. And what did Jesus say about denying him before men? He gave us a description of what that looks like. And a lot of people, they don't read that part, but he did. See, when you deny Christ, you deny that a person can be saved. You deny redemption. You deny his love for humanity. You deny repentance. 
You do that before people. You have denied him before people. To deny Christ is to deny the gospel. To deny the gospel is to deny Christ. And if you do that before people, the Lord said he would deny you before the angels. That means you're not going with him in the end. Do you see that? That means we have choices right now. We're going to have to really have some deep thoughts about it. See, a time is coming where people can no longer have the excuse, well, you know, this is the only way I can survive. They're going to say that with the mark of the beast. I don't think a lot of people truly understand the extent of the mark of the beast. They want it to be something outlined so easy that they can easily deny it, right? Wrong. It will require a person to deny the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will require a person to deny Christ. It will. Do you know that some people wear the mark, the invisible mark right now? They're wearing it right now and they don't know it. They're doing it because they deny everything about Christ by accepting everything in the world, by defending all these things of the world against the living God. See how that is? You guys see that? You guys starting to see that? Everybody wants things cut and dry so they can take the easy way out. Wouldn't that be kind of true? Because what if the mark is very involved? It's kind of like the social security cards when they came out. People said, I'm not getting that. That's the mark. It's the Antichrist. That's the mark of the Antichrist. I'm not getting that. Yet, everybody has one right now. I heard people talking about real ID. I'm not getting a real ID. I don't have to get one. Everybody's, you know, they got them. People say that with driver's license. People said that with credit cards. I'm not getting a credit card. It's on 666 Street. I'm not getting that. That's surely the mark of the beast. Everything is Visa and MasterCard. Everything goes right through there, right? How many people denied that? Because all banks go through them now. I used to hear people about what cell phones. I'm not getting one of those phones that can see you and, you know, that can take pictures and do all these little functions. I'm not getting that. Yep, they have them now. Do you see what's happening? There's always going to be somebody that comes along and says, Hey, you're okay. If this thing is just this. That's all. It's no big deal. More people's lives have been totally turned upside down with the introduction of the internet and pornography, period. It has ruined and broken marriages, families, children. More people are murdered because of the internet. Not the regular internet, but the dark web. And we're not just talking about, you know, some crud criminals out there. Nope, we're talking about people in the body of Christ going to prison, going to jail because they've been on the dark web. They get attracted to things they shouldn't be attracted to. And then they get caught and locked up. Somebody said, how do we how do we ensure we don't get tricked? You can't get tricked into taking the mark. Let me ask you this. How many of you love the gospel? If you love the gospel, you do not have pleasure in unrighteousness. You cannot love the gospel and have pleasure in unrighteousness. How many of you love this world and the things in the world? How many of you love the things in the world a lot so much you can't give them up? That excuse, I can't get rid of it, that's going to die. That's not going to work out too well for people. Listen to me, give it your all. What you're unable to accomplish, the Lord will accomplish in you. But you've got to give it your all. If, you, if anybody continues to give themselves excuses, it's going to be over. You will not make it. The only time we give ourselves excuses is when we have enjoyment in this world. Would you all agree? And you know that matches the scripture. The scripture that says... People are having pleasure in unrighteousness. What is the world? Why in the Bible does it say to love the world is to have enmity with God? Look at what's in the world. Somebody names something in the world that is noble and not corrupted. Somebody. Can somebody name something in the world that's not corrupted? Name something in the world where you do not have to compromise your faith to be a complete part of, to uphold it. Let me continue real quick. You guys starting to see it? Verse 4. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament a doleful lamentation, and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away hath divided our fields. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. Prophesy ye not, say they, listen, say they to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take the same. You know what that means? Don't prophesy to those folks. Don't tell them it's going to be okay. Don't do it. That's a warning. Don't you tell those people it's going to be okay because it's not. 
Those that prophesy, don't prophesy to them and tell them it's going to be okay. Because it's not. It's not going to be okay. Don't make your abode here. Folks, all of you who live in these countries, you're passers-by. This is not your paradise. Too many people are trying to make everywhere they live their paradise. They're trying to make it this fortress, this place, this like no other. This is not the kingdom of God. This is not a place of rest. This is not a place to put your paradise. This is temporary and all of it's going away. And everybody is soon to get a reminder about that in a time they're not thinking of, in a time they're not aware of. Because if they're not aware of that right now, this very night, it's coming at a time they're not aware of. Rise ye and depart. This is not your rest, it says in verse 10. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. If a man walketh in the spirit, and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. Do you hear that? Listen, if a, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood, if they lie, saying, prophesy unto thee of wine. You know what wine is? That means you can sit back and enjoy yourselves. That means you can, you know, release yourself a little bit. That's what it means. You can just release things a little bit. It says, prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. So God will assign that lying individual that seems like he's walking in the spirit to a people who want to hear exactly what they have to say. Are you guys ready for that? That's already here. In other words, God will assign a spirit to those who are looking for that spirit. He's going to assign a person who's, who talks that stuff to the people who want to hear it. We know that by the New Testament also. We know that by the declaration that people would no longer endure sound doctrine, but would heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. What does that mean? Well, if you're sitting at your table and you heap to yourself teachers because you have itchy ears you've simply gone on the internet to bring up videos and podcasts and audios from the internet of what you want to hear if somebody starts talking about something you don't want to hear you go to somebody else that'll say something you want to hear and that's how people do i don't want to hear that i want to hear that one so you just go find it so what does the lord's word say about that though if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie saying I will prophesy unto thee of wine and strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. So God will allow that to continue. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as sheep of Basra, and a flock in the midst of their fold. And they shall make a great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gates and are listen and are gone out by it and their king shall pass before them and the lord on the head of them notice here it says and the lord not their lord and the lord on the head of them something is about to happen here so by chapter this is just chapter one and it describes what's happening right now in the world doesn't it right now in the world these same things are happening why because israel happens to be the mother of standards of the entire earth why is that because God established it. That's why. He established that first. He established it first. He established you first. All of you who believe in the Lord in homes of people who don't actually believe, you're the standard of that home. By your activities, evil or goodness will be in that household. See, when you're in a household and people are doing all things to you and you lose your cool, you lose your temperance, you just lose it when you give up where you're no longer maintaining that root spiritually. You're allowing darkness to overcome, and it will overcome. Now, when you rebuke something, you don't have to say that word rebuke to rebuke something. When you rebuke something, you're standing against it. So that if something, if, if an argument grows up in your house, and you're against the spirit that caused that argument, if you can see it that way, then you just refuse to argue. Because surely they're going to look at you and say, well, isn't that right? They're going to try and drag you into the conversation. You'll always have an opportunity not to join in with any evil thing. So understand that. So, so, so when they look at you and say, isn't that right, trying to drag you into the conversation, don't they do that around holidays? 
you guys are around your family and you find yourself getting drawn into conversations you don't want to be a part of. Haven't you taken the wrong time or, or somebody thought you took the wrong side and you end up getting blamed for it, you feel bad for it because you didn't, you didn't take the side of that person who was talking that way, right? So when they try to drag you into it and you just simply say, no, nah, I'm not in this one, right? You put a halt to it. You'd be surprised what cannot happen in that place. I'm talking about you, whether you're a little old you or big old you. It's you because you believe in Christ. And if you don't give in to the evil spirits working to, to encourage the people to do weird things, you're rebuking them. When you actually rebuke something, you don't do it by your mouth. You do it by how you stand in life. If you rebuke something, you're not going to take part of any evil thing that you just rebuked. Parents, when you have kids that come home and they get out of control, right? Haven't you noticed that you got out of control before they came home? Somebody called you on the phone. You read something you didn't like. You mumbled to yourself. You allowed that spirit to work within you. And guess what? You're the doorway. When you allow a spirit to work within you, it's going right to your kids. And right after you were moved the wrong way, it got to them, didn't it? See, when you stand your ground and you say, no, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to get mad at this person. I'm going to bless that person. You don't have to do a blessing out loud. You can just simply say, Lord, remember that person. When you do that, when you're in communication with the Father like that anyway, right? It keep, he will keep your heart in the right place because you've turned to him. You haven't turned to yourself. You didn't turn to any alternative. You turn to him and he will keep you that way. When you do that, you shut the door to spirits who will try and work through your children. Because if a spirit can't get to you, they're going to get to the ones you love. When they can't get to you directly, they're going to everybody you love. They know who you love already. They're going to try and get you to allow them to work in you. And if they can do that, they can get to everybody else because you're the door. Just like Israel's a door for the world. Just like through Israel, this world can be healed tonight. The Lord could come tonight because of Israel. If they ever said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, I'm telling you it's all over. But God said they wouldn't do it until a certain time. Therefore, no one knows the day nor the hour. But have you noticed the same things Jacob, Israel, Jerusalem have gone through? It's in your life too. The exact same things. Not some of the same things. Everything they went through. It's in your life too. They went through things physically. You've gone through the spiritual conditions. And they're written down in this Bible. Why is it that all these things have manifested in your life? And the outcome has been exactly as written in this Bible. Exactly. Not halfway. Not sometimes. Exactly. And when you start to examine your own life, right? Especially if you have, if you have a, you get a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about everything Israel has gone through and about what you've gone through. You're going to start seeing the similarities. It will blow you away. Did you not know you can have the blessing? The same blessings that are upon Israel are also upon you. In the day you do it God's way, God will break things in your life. He will rebuke the devourer. He'll become that defensed city around you. He'll become exactly what you need him to be. Why? Because if you obey him, that's you saying, Father, you are my father. When you disobey him, that's you saying, Father, you're not my father. Do you guys get that? Somebody said, in the same day, if you're sincere, you better believe it. In the same day. That's not a joke either. The turnaround is instantaneous. It's based on your sincerity. Suppose a person divides, they say, well, I'm going to try it God's way to see if this situation changes tonight. How can anybody do that? Isn't that testing God to see if he's going to react? That's no good to do. You're going to be sincere. Here's sincerity. Lord, whether you intercede or not, I choose you and your way. Whether it kills me or not, whether I die or not, I choose you, Lord. I choose to obey you. You can only do that if you actually respect and honor and have a true fear that is high respect of the Most High. When you do that, things are broken. I keep trying to tell you guys miracles are happening that you, 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 you should be a part of what's happening. Drug addictions are being broken within seconds. A sincerity and a time I've not witnessed before. Things are starting to happen repetitively, quickly, and nobody goes back. Nobody, you know, they don't get delivered one day, and then, you know, a month later, they're back on the stuff again. No, not only is the habit broken, not only is the addiction nullified, but the person has no desire to go back. But I've noticed something. 
all those who have received these type healings, they are quite sincere about the Lord God being their Father and Christ being their Savior and Lord. They're very sincere. Many of them say for the first time they can see his words, they can hear him for the first time. People are starting to admit, one person admitted they've been a part of the church for 25 years and they never heard Christ. They never saw the Lord in his word and they finally saw it and they finally heard the voice of the Lord through his word and things started changing right away. Things are still happening. There. Now, actually, they're more than still happening. And I personally believe as things get darker and people just start doing bad things, the anointing is going to get stronger and stronger over each of you. That means resolve is right there at your fingertips. It's based upon your sincerity. If I had some sort of agenda, if I did and I were trying to do something and manipulate everybody to do, you know, this little thing here and this little thing there, I would have been dead a long time ago. I do honestly believe I'm sustained out of God's grace, and he honors his word of those things I keep of him. I live my life that way. I can see it. But there's no way I'll ever replace who God is in my life, not because of what I can get out of him, but because everything he's done. See, I happen to believe this word. I have no need to change anything in this word. I never go into the Word of God and say, well, maybe they meant this, and maybe they meant that, because I don't do that. I pray about it. If I don't know something in the Word of God, I will pray about it. I'll always do that. And the Lord has always showed me three places of every question I ever had. There's always three places in the Word of God that same thing is found every single time. That's impossible. That is. That's impossible. Nobody's that smart to subconsciously bring that out of the Word of God. Nobody is. We live in a time when people need truth. They don't need another theory. They don't need some, some wishful statement. We need truth. And I rely upon the Most High. I do. It's very easy for me to tell you, right? If you're looking for some wisdom out of me, you're not going to get it. Wisdom can come through me. Do you guys see that? Because I'm not the author of anything that ever came out of me that actually was a benefit to somebody else. I'm not the author. I do honor and respect the Most High deeply. I believe in His Word. There's nothing in me that desires to change anything. There's no compensation mechanism within me that I need to ease the Word of God to so I can escape it. No. In fact, I wouldn't even read this Word if it did not condemn things in my flesh. I would not do it. Do you guys see the similarities and the declarations of the Lord from beginning to end are the same? How is it that we miss them? This Gaza-Israel problem? I'm sure that a lot of people found scriptures that, that depict this, right? Now, I'm not looking at the word itself, but the spiritual operation that's taking place. What is it changing in the world? That, that always catches my eye. It's always unfortunate, the violence of men. But the Father has capabilities to nullify in a tragic time that anybody ever had on the face of the earth. I already know that because I lived through that myself. But it's spiritually causing something in the world. Something that, you know, I see it every day is no one has power to change it. And there's an uprising taking place outside of this war that's going to affect everybody almost instantaneously. In fact, it's already been at work. It's just not been pointed at. And it's almost like it can't be seen yet as with most things they are noticed after they take effect after they have dug themselves in it's kind of like some of the messages people used to hear in the uh, 80s i remember people used to say things are going to get better god showed me they, they used to say this god showed me things are going to get better and that now ne that never agreed with anything in me i didn't say anything i didn't criticize i didn't do any of that but i used to hear that from everybody every new year's People would make a declaration on how things would get better, how prosperous people would be. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know precisely what I'm talking about. And progressively, things have gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, haven't they? People have become brutal. In fact, people are lining up to be exactly how God described them to be. I remember people, large crowds, used to get excited because they thought that somehow, right, if they all believed all this, you know, the world would change based on what they wanted. And in doing so, they would ignore prophecy. They were just ignoring what the Lord said. I was born knowing things were going downhill quickly. But see, we also identified 
and some of these generations, some of the schemes that were taking place, right? We, we saw that. We saw that. In fact, you guys, surely you remember the spirit involved. I know you remember that spirit. Well, okay, well, maybe you can get away with that. Nobody, you know, nobody cares, right? But it's different now. Things are different now. It's almost like people who have gone corrupt, they absolutely have gone corrupt. I mean, they've gone super corrupt. And the people who are staying on the side of Christ, they are so mindful of the Savior and the things of the Most High. They're starting to really see and, and they're really choosing their placement with the Lord in everything. In everything. It's, in fact, it's becoming harder and harder to do anything outside of righteousness. Because you, anytime you want to do something that you used to do that may be bound in unrighteousness, you find yourself not having or not having that desire to do. You are, I remember, two, th was it three, three or four years ago? I argued with myself. And I haven't done that in a long time. And what that was, was when you make a choice, you're weighing out everything, right? But when the father's involved, when it, when it deals with righteousness, it's just that one way conversation. And it was almost like everything in me was saying, well, let's just go ahead and do it that way, you know? It's not going to hurt anybody. Yeah, but it's still not, I'm not joining in with that. I'm not joining in with that. I was looking at what it was contributing to, what it was supporting. What would the ultimate outcome be? And I said, that's not righteousness. I can't do it. It was an argument I had with him. I said, we know what that actually was. So those are spirits trying to downplay righteousness, saying, go ahead and do it. There's no big deal. Those who are serious now, they're getting to the point where they won't compromise in anything. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. It really is. And it's becoming stronger. It is. So are the manifestations of exactly what God said. They're becoming stronger. Not manifestations as far as riches. You know what? Because how many people are still looking for riches? Honestly. They used to. That used to be the major conversation. The Lord speaks about that too. He speaks about that. Right here in Micah. What they're going through right now. We don't escape the same thing. They have a decision to make in Israel. These activities that you see in Israel, they are highly relevant to your daily life. What Israel goes through physically, you're going to encounter spiritually. You know how in the Bible it says you're going to be hated of all men for his name's sake? It also says that Israel is going to be hated of all nations. Correct? Right now, what are they saying? Death to Israel. Aren't they saying that? Even in America, they're saying death to Israel. They're making their small little declarations that Iran came up with. I won't repeat it because I don't like that saying. But they are saying this stuff. They're saying this stuff. The same thing is going to manifest in our lives. And you know who put the seal on that? The Most High did. He said, all of us are going to endure this. Now, we're not talking about tribulation. My whole life has been tribulation. Y'all can be scared of it if you want. My life is in the hands of the Messiah, so I take no thought of that. But these accusations against Israel, the circumstances dealing with Hamas, the same thing is coming into the believer's life. The same thing is coming into the believer's life. Some of you have been given spiritual eyes to see it among the people around you at its beginning. You've had a taste of accusations. You've had a taste of the hatred and violence. You've had a taste, right, that people would believe them over you. They don't want to hear a word you have to say, and they will have sympathy for those who come against you. And their, re their reasoning will not make sense. But the people will understand the reasoning of the other folks, but they won't understand yours. For many of you, it's happening already. You have to be first. If it's happening right now, you have to be first. That means it's going to be important for you to help those who are about to go through it. That's just simply a principle of our Father. Somebody always has to go first. And those who go first, right? Those who go first, they endure the conditions so they can gain wisdom and understanding of what's happening so they can walk somebody else through it so that you can be an encouragement for the other ones who are not as strong as you that they're going to go through it. Somebody always has to be first. Those of you who are teachers, right? You like to teach about the Word of God. You're going to go through it. You will always go through something first. You can never speak to people if you haven't gone through what they've gone through. How can you ever help someone if you've gone through nothing? That means you have to go through everything. Go back and look at the prophet's life. You think they had a good life? Then read that again. They endured everything. But see, when you, when you want to help people, listen to your spirit to help somebody else, you don't care what you go through. You only have a concern 
that you assist somebody else. You don't care what you go through. When you have that in your heart, when it's part of your calling, when it's real, you don't care what you go through. You don't care what you lose. You don't care what's lost, sacrificed, how you look, or anything else. You just want somebody else to make it. But for those of you who will be soon recipients of this process, right? It is, in fact, a process. What you're reading right now is part of God's process. These declarations against Judah, Jerusalem, and Israel are part of God's process. Listen, not for punishment, but for something else. That's why I stated in Micah, unless you are spiritual, you'll not understand it. You'll get it all wrong. That's exactly what it says in Micah. You're, you're going to get it all wrong if you see this with anything other than a spiritual and truthful eye. You're going to get it all wrong. If you see it from the outside, you're going to get it all wrong. Everything the Lord's doing here from chapter 1 on through is a blessing to the people that undergo it. Do you know that? It's a blessing to Jerusalem. It's a blessing to Israel. It's a blessing to Judah. It's not some curse. It's a blessing. Chapter 3. And I said, here, I pray you. O heads of Jacob, you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Question one. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them. They break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as the flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. You know what this is? Hear me on this one. This is when people, they sit there and say to themselves, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this evil thing because I'm going to be saved anyway. No. Even Jesus said that. All right, let me give you guys the uh, small insight to a mystery. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until it be taken out of the way. Then that wicked one will be revealed. So that man of perdition comes forward. So what does that mean? The mystery of iniquity. Mystery means hidden. The hidden iniquity is already working. Follow me on this. If it's already working, then the seat of the beast is already established. The kingdom of the beast is already established. It's already at work. How do we know this? The people who will end up following the beast will not call him a beast. They're going to think he's great. They're going to think what he's doing is great. They're going to think he's an answer. You all know this. Here's the problem. Though. He's going to come forward, be revealed to everybody. But the kingdom will have already been established. Even in Revelation it says that they worship the beast, but they also worship the dragon who came first and gave power to the beast. Right now, billions of people worship the beast. It's not called the beast. But it is against the ways of our Father. And we're talking about those ways right now. They're worshiping the beast. They're fully immersed in the kingdom of the beast. And they love it the way they have it. Because they keep running back to it. Let me give this key. See, the Lord said, I will send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. That they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. First of all, if God sends a delusion, whoever he sends a delusion to is not getting out of it. They're not going to wake up from it. That delusion is so that they believe a lie. If he sends them a delusion that they believe a lie, then they carry on as though what they're doing is not in the realm of unrighteousness. Or like most people today. Uh, well, you know, this is just how things are. God understands. People have made to themselves their own God. That's why they have so many self-interpretations, so they can get away with the dirt they're doing. And when I say dirt, I mean things bound in unrighteousness, like half the bills that are being passed in Washington, D.C., by these senators who sit there and say they love God. What God are they talking about? Not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not that God. Because that God says that certain things are an abomination. So why would they stand behind anything that's an abomination? And... For those who think, well, they, you know, they're, they're good people. Really? Have you looked at their record to see what they have actually passed? The Lord just told us they, you know, that people lie, that people seem like they walk in the spirit and do lie. And they prophesy and they talk about the word of God, but they're liars. And they say, let's drink strong drink. Let's make ourselves a better kingdom. 
They give false promises, things of that nature. Here's a false promise when you say things are going to get better. The Lord specifically is against anybody who sit, would sit there and tell everybody things are going to get better. He just told us in First Micah, don't prophesy to those people that things are going to get better. Don't prophesy unto them that things are going to be okay because things are not going to be okay. We're a living testament to that. Things have gotten progressively worse and they're almost out of control, non-retrievable. So those who are given over to a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, they're already having pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see that? God said he'll send them that strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Ultimately, because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. How many of you have pleasure in unrighteousness? How many of you have pleasure in the demise of another? Because if you start following the kingdoms of this world, you're going to have pleasure in the murder of another. It's going to be in your heart to murder another person. That will be found out. See, when you join the mob that says crucify that person or crucify that person, can't you see what the Lord is doing right now? Can you see what he's doing? He's slowly revealing these things. And even Christians are saying crucify him. That's what they're saying. Crucify him. Punish him. Throw them out in their lives. They're not worth life, period. People are being usurped all over this world. And that's the end result of their thinking. They become murderers, just like God said they would. They're doing it right now. Right now they're doing it. And if you join into it, we already read that no one will escape that. When they call out for the living God in the time of their calamity, the Lord's not going to hear them. Why? Because they knew better. And they chose against the Most High. And they upheld the world. And they put down the good of the living God. They could never fulfill what Jesus, his commandment to them, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. They can never do that. Those who belong to Christ, they will keep that commandment very close to them. Those who don't belong to Christ, they cannot keep that commandment. They will always murder. It's funny how people think. You, you, you guys remember that people used to, people are locked into this thing that somehow that strong delusion that God is going to send is going to be obvious to everybody. Let me remind you of something. This is 2,000 plus years after Christ. Jesus said in regards to Revelation, the time is at hand. He didn't say the time is coming. He said the time was at hand. Most people say, well, that was Nero. Yeah, let them keep thinking that. Because the same experts with that mindset could not see the Messiah coming when he came to die for our sins. They did not know it was him. They really did not know it was him. The experts did not know it was him. The ones who were not experts, they saw that it was him. But the ones who were experts, the ones who were convinced they knew what they were talking about, they could not see him. The kingdom of the beast cannot be seen by those who defend it, those who believe in its ways, those who are joining in with it, those who have pleasure in unrighteousness. What is unrighteousness? To kill your neighbor, to covet your neighbor's stuff. That's unrighteousness. The kingdoms of this world, are they holy? No, they're not. When I was a lot younger, somebody tried to convince me that somehow America was holy. I said, no, it isn't. Without knowing what I was saying, I said, there's no way America's holy. And somehow I understood this one phrase, you'll know a tree by its fruit. So all you have to do is take a look around, and you're seeing the fruit of the kingdom. If the kingdom were holy, people would be upholding holy policies. But what do you see? Murder, violence, rape children being taken you guys don't know that the number of children that are being taken in america has almost doubled since 2020 doubled since 2020 not doubled since 1990 not doubled since the 1800s doubled since 2020 that's the fruit of this nation you know fights are breaking out in the house floor one was tonight they had one earlier today they hate each other with a passion both parties have fallen apart. Both parties have become almost dishonorable. Both parties forget a party and uphold the kingdom of the living God that is not tainted by men's ways. But I'll tell you something. There's a group of good people out there that are going to show you what these two parties have been planning. And none of you will like what they've been planning. None of you will like what they've said behind closed doors. Have you guys noticed that audio recordings and phone calls are being published? See, people thought they had it one way wrong. Let me tell you something. Somebody who stands in holiness 
is never going to be preoccupied with prosecuting somebody else. You know why? Because they know, they know the principle of the living God. You know what that principle is. Evil will not prosper. Evil will always be seen for what it is. And people will be able to see it openly. Because anything that's been in secret is going to be yelled from the rooftops. They know that principle. But when you go around prosecuting something, right? And you need to shut it up quickly. Something is wrong with you. You can't have dirt to try and hide the dirt on the other side. And I'm telling you, there's some deep, nasty dirt on both sides. And when everybody starts finding out about it, they're going to regurgitate in their mouths. That's when people will stop with the party stuff and say, Oh, my Lord, I should have stayed with Christ. What was I doing? It's going to break the hip, the hypnotized folks down there. There are folks that are hypnotized. They really are. No matter how wicked things have become. See, I don't know about you guys, but violence to me is wickedness. No good comes from that. Telling the American people one thing, while you sit up in your house and you're rich and you're laughing and joking and drinking about what people believe, that's no good. That's no good. And when people actually believe it and they're fighting in the streets over you and you're lying to them and you're laughing about it like the people are trash, when the people find out those that have eaten of a portion of their meat, they're going to destroy them. That's what's going to happen. All these people who have built up aggression will destroy their own parties for what they have done. They won't escape it because all they're doing is causing murder to double around the earth. If any of them were righteous, if any of them sought any good, you know and I know they'd be thrown out. You have to be a wolf to be in those places. So all of them are covering for some very nasty things. No one's innocent up there. Please don't fall for that. And it's all about to come out in the open. Let's continue. And I said, here, I pray, O heads of Jacob, you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones and chop them into pieces. As for the pot the flesh within the cauldron, then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at their time, at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace. He hath, look, and he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Therefore, night shall be unto you, not to everybody else. Night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you. You know what that is? I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. Let me not get ahead of myself. You guys don't think I've had some strong correction in some areas from the Most High. Here we go. Here we go. Let me let me finish this. Therefore, shall, therefore night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, that ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confound it. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Do you know what that is? Here's the deal. I'm going to tell you this from experience. When you recognize something within yourselves, a gift, insight, knowledge, or something of that nature, all too often you start to hear voices and advisors around you who would seek to exploit your ability to see to cause you to complete their agenda. You fall into that. Don't think you're going to play the innocent role there. Here's what happened to me. That a similar situation like that happened to me. Why did I fall for it? Because it seemed to be the best direction for my future. Hear those words? The best direction for my future. In other words, right? It would not make waves. It wouldn't stir the pot too much. Everybody would be satisfied. Here's what I didn't know. The ones who were doing this, they, whatever they had, they lost. These same people began to exploit other folks whom they could recognize something in. For example, if a person has a gift and some other person lost their gift, they're going to exploit people who have the gift if they want to continue to perpetuate whatever they have established. They're going to bring you on board and use you like a fuel tank to do their agenda. If you fall for that, that's on your head. Let me tell you why. You cannot be tricked. Take that out of your vocabulary. If you do something, right, 
You're going to do it for personal gain. You're going to do it because that's the direction you want to take because they have offered you something and you have agreed to receive something for what you're doing. That means for less than authentic reasons. Less than authentic reasons. And when you do that, you're going to go dark. And when I say dark, everything's going to go black. You're going to be empty, void. You're not going to see anything. Nobody's going to talk to you, advise you. You're not going to have guidance or anything else. And you don't want yourselves to go dark. You don't want to be in this world and you have no guidance. You have no direction. You have no insight. But you don't want that. And that's already happened to a lot of people. Their well has gone dry. When your well goes dry, the only thing you can do is dovetail off everybody else. You have nothing original. You have nothing from the living God. You have nothing relevant, right? All you can do, all you can do is hear something somebody else said and go tell that to somebody else. That's all you can do. That's when you're cut off. We just read the word of the Lord and what happens to people who compromise in that way. They have no vision. They have no insight. They have no instruction. They have nothing. They can't hear anything from the living God. Why does this happen? This will always happen when a person chooses gain over genuineness. Do you hear me? This will always happen when you disregard what you know for real about the living God and you go follow somebody else's way so that you don't clutter your own future so that you can continue to do something else. Don't do that to yourselves. That comes with a great penalty. You don't want things to go dark. You don't want to be cut off. Even those of you who say, well, I don't dream, I have no extraordinary things, I'm telling you right now, you're getting guidance. You don't want things to go dark. You do not want that. You don't want that. Because if you ever experienced that, it would plague you day and night. You don't want that at all. See, the truth is you are being guided. You do receive instruction. It may not be to the level you want it to be, but it's there. Which means your father has not cut you off yet. Which means you haven't, you haven't fully knowledgeably taken a path that's worthy of that type of punishment. Don't do that to yourselves. It is not a place you want to be. See, if you fall for something, I'm telling you now it's going to be your fault. Do you know why? Because we only fall for things when they seem profitable to us. If you fall for something in a relationship, you wanted something somebody had in a relationship. Let's go ahead and face that truth. Nobody tricks us. We do what we do for gain. That's how Satan baits and lures us. That's what temptation is. Temptation, by way of temptation, a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lusts. It must exist in you for it to work. Satan cannot tempt you with something that does not exist in you. It must be in you first. Do you guys have that? Don't take that path. Be genuine all the way. See, in my life, I've had so much correction. So many things have gone wrong. Many things have gone wrong. I'm telling you right now, it's by sheer grace that I'm right here right now. Only by grace. Not that I deserve it. No, but I'll tell you something else. Satan cannot fool me. I can see him at work walking. His manipulative tricks and everything else. I can see it. I was behind the door that's behind the door. You don't have to experience that to be genuine. Choose to be genuine. See, once you see something, once you see it, once you see something, it will not require faith for you to believe in it. And guess what? It's impossible to please God without faith. Once you see it, you cannot please God in that area anymore. It's going to be part of your daily task or obligation. Part of your responsibilities. The more you're exposed to, the more you see, the more that's proven to you, the less you can please God in that area. When a person by faith follows the living God, not because of what they've seen, but because they love the living God, that pleases the living God, that they would believe in him that way. Just like a child trusting his parent, so is, so is God. He is lifted up by you when you by faith follow him. But if you see it, it no longer requires faith. If you experience something, you don't have to have faith in that area because it's been proven to you and you cannot please God in that area. But folks, are you listening to me? Because a lot of people want to see everything. They want to see, experience, and know everything. No, you don't. You want to be genuine above all things. Listen, you're going to know everything at some point. You're going to see everything at some point. You're going to be in a different form for real. That's not a joke. So by faith, walk your... Walk your life out. 
Understand that what the Lord has given you is sufficient. Utilize it. He'll make you a steward over much. If you can be responsible for the little he's already given you, be genuine. Overcome evil in your life. Don't play a role with evil. Please don't do that. Because when you're blind, you become desperate. When you're desperate, you're going to make some real, not so smart decisions. And all of that comes from a blindness. God didn't blind you. He opened your eyes. Be a part of the number of redemption. Because once that number is met, he's going to open up the eyes of his own people again. His first people again. And that'll be the end of that. You've been given an opportunity to really be family with the Most High. Don't make it a routine. Don't make it something superficial. Some custom where your heart's not really involved. Understand what it is by examining what the Lord has put in you already. Don't covet everybody else's gifts. Be thankful for the ones he's given you. Understand the ones he's given you. Utilize what he's put in you for the cause he calls righteous. And experience his deliverance. Experience what he can do for you. Don't get anything secondhand. Be a witness of his goodness in this earth. All that's initiated when you begin to operate by what he put in you initially. He put the truth in you before you could read. Always go back to that. Keep that in your minds. It'll serve you well in many areas of your life. When you start to question yourself, well, do I believe because I read this, because I saw this or heard this? You can say, no, he put this in me when I was a tiny tot before I could remember anything I could remember. I knew this naturally. He put that in me. Nobody else did. That way you're not given over to the scientific club, trying to analyze everything scientifically, logically. No, he's given you the ability to see things spiritually, but as well beyond logic. To see something logically is simply to see what's before you, the tangible part, not the hidden part. Logic can never discern the hidden of anything. Do you know that? But if you could see the logical part and the hidden part, then you already know the outcome. You'll already know the outcome. You can already evaluate where nobody else can. You can see the whole path of something. Well, if you could do that, you'd be unstoppable. What the Lord has given you is sufficient, but you can't ignore what he's given you and covet everything else or desire everything else ignoring and not being a steward of what he's given you originally. Be a good steward of what he's given you, and you'll find that those things expand. They grow. They become what you could never believe. Be a witness of your Father's goodness, deliverance, His Word, His truth. Be a witness of it, a real witness. Not by way of reading, but by way of experiencing. Be a child all the way. He's given all of us exactly what we needed. All we have to do is use it and be genuine with Him. Because if not, you become like those you see on television. And you're soon to see the consequences of being like that. They have no ability to see what they have chosen already. And you're going to be first-hand witnesses of that. They will kill each other. Do you guys hear me? They will devour one another right before your eyes. They will end up as nothing because they're not choosing the Lord. They're choosing themselves. Then shall the seers be ashamed and the diviners confounded, yea. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God but truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment and of might to declare unto you, Jacob, his transgression, and to Israel, his sin. Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob, ye princes of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment or hate judgment and pervert all equity. Now those who hate judgment, do you guys know what that is? Abhor judgment. This word judgment is not what people are used to defining judgment as, just so you know that. This word judgment is the same word that's used when he says judge the fatherless. How do you judge the fatherless? Well, they have no father. And if they have no father, they have no instruction, they're going to be a little bit wild. So what does that mean? To judge the fatherless is to have more patience with them. Uh-oh. Is to have a lot of patience with them, understanding that they've had no guidance. That means they require a lot of training, a lot of patience, a lot of love. See how that has nothing to do with criticizing anything, does it? But pouring yourself into somebody else to understand their position. To understand the position of another is also this word judgment. To declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin, hear this, I pray you heads of the house of Jacob and the princes of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. 
They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean, listen, yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, It is not the Lord among us, claiming because of their affiliation heritage or their appearance, the Lord is with us while they do their dirt. Let's continue. And they also say, None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Did you guys hear that? He said, for your sakes. What's going to happen for their sakes? Zion is going to be plowed as a field. Jerusalem is going to become heaps, and the mountains of the house as the high places of the forest. What is he talking about? He's going to purge his finger for their sakes. For their sakes, he's going to turn everything so that those elements that do not belong there will no longer be in there. See, when you take up a place, right, only those who truly belong there will actually call it home and they will never abandon it. But when you don't really belong in a place and it starts to shake violently, and everything falls to the ground, you're gone to another place. Like a roach. So what the Lord is going to do, is he's going to take his hands and put it on that land in those places. And they're going to shake violently in many different ways. And all the roaches are going to scatter. Now those who call that place home, they have nowhere else to go, do they? They have nowhere else to go. See, when you call a place home, you don't care what happens to it. You're going to clean it up. You're going to have a newfound appreciation for it you're going to come clean you're going to remember oh i took this place for granted and i shouldn't have and you're going to do what what's ever required to restore that place when it's home when it's not home you're going to go find a new home that's what you'll do you'll find a new place that's what the lord is going to do he's going to do that for their sakes so all of what we just read is god separating iniquity from them your process in this life God is separating you from your transgression. He forgives you of it, yes. But how do, you, how do you keep a person? How do you really get a person to see the truth of their doings? It takes a very involved process to present the doings of all of us to us, right? And to get us to see the truth of it, that we would let go of the transgressions and choose the good. See, it's naturally within us to choose righteousness. The problem is there have been so many people talking and polluting the truth that all too often we don't know what to believe. All too often we think certain things are good, wholesome, and acceptable, and they're not. We get confused. And so what the Lord is going to do is send us through his process. In his process, we will not make a mistake on what is good and what is evil. He's going to show us directly what good and evil is. We live through it. See, it's like a person, when you see a person, you say, that's a good person, right? Or you say, that's a bad person. But then you, you know that person for eight years. And then when, for the one you thought was bad, they end up being good. And the good person ends up being bad. Only because you knew them for eight years. Only because you spent a lot of time with them. Only because you saw what kept popping up and what never came up. Because you got to see them for who they were in multiple situations. Because you were allowed to evaluate them. Because you saw the good and the bad of them. And you saw what they actually chose. Because your evaluation was real. Because you were forced to endure the evil of that person you thought was good. You endured their evil for years. And now you know they're not good. And that person you thought was bad. You endured their kindness for years. And now you know you misjudged that person. That's what the Lord is doing. All of us have been in circumstances and situations, many that have cost us dearly. They have. But guess what? You know what you've been around. You know it. You didn't know that before. You could not hear a person speak and then hear certain deceitful things in there because you didn't know it was deceit. You didn't know. You couldn't evaluate things properly because you had no experience with things properly. So the Lord had you live a situation. And he showed you what things were. And then you started to make choices. Many of us went straight to the Lord. We saw ourselves too. 
we found out that we were wicked. That if we did not get help from the living God, that we would be lost. That we would continue to choose iniquitous things. We also found out we had strong desires that were of the flesh, but they were strong. We know exactly what the flesh is and what the flesh desires. We know that when we were in sin, right, we often defended ourselves by speaking like everybody else spoke, saying that, well, everybody else does it, to make ourselves feel comfortable. While we went by ourselves and we were uncomfortable with our own decision, we knew what we were doing. So we learned not to be hypocrites. We started to choose the path of righteousness. And the more we chose the Lord's way, the more we experienced the Lord. That's what life is. Life is a process. Life's a process of God showing us exactly what is what. And when we know the truth of light and darkness, then we finally choose. And that also, so God was delivering his people. For the sake of his people, he had them go through horrible things. For the sake of their souls, he had them see what no one should see. Us too, many of us went through terrible things. But if we did not go through those terrible things, we would have been lost to sin right now. We would have. Thank God for his ways. Folks, that's what I wanted you to see tonight. That these things that you see on television, they look terrible, don't they? But they're part of God's process. He's going to show everybody exactly, exactly what they've been doing. He will present to us the truth. And we will choose by way of truth. And then, then you'll know who chose what. It's a process, and it's a good one. And God does this out of love. He hates the sinful things that we do, because those sinful things were introduced by Satan, not by him. He loves us, but he does not love our transgression. Now you know why he does this. He just said that in Micah, that he was doing what he was doing, essentially to deliver them from what they continued to do. We can't deliver ourselves. That's a truth all of us should come to shortly. We can't do it. We tried, we thought we did from time to time, only to regress back in our own ways again. But the Lord seeks to deliver us all the way. So, if you truly believe in Christ, if you honestly believe in Christ, and you believe in His sacrifice, and you believe in the gospel, but sometimes you can't get things right, listen to me. Keep going. Keep fighting the good fight of faith, because you're in the middle of a process, and the Lord is delivering you.